Tim, thank you for joining us. Delighted. Thank you, thank you for having me. So, let's talk about financing new nuclear in the UK. How is that going to be done? Right. Well, there's, first of all, we have to recognise that there are limits to markets. You've seen that with Horizon. You know, any organisation that writes off $1.7 in one year and then sees a share price increase of 8% tells you something about the financing market's reaction to all this. So, first of all, let me just give you a stat. For a big nuclear reactor, the cost of capital is the biggest single factor, more than capital cost. For every one percentage point change in the cost of capital, the strike price for uh, a big nuclear plant changes by about 13 or 14 pounds a megawatt hour for one percentage point. So if you can drive that number down, you're basically removing a completely unnecessary tax on the economy. So that's the context why this really matters. Secondly, nuclear projects are about the best you're ever going to see as an investment category for pension funds. They've got the right sort of duration, the right sort of return, and what you need is the, is the financial security that says, actually, I'm not worried about day-to-day -day financing, but I have a, a, a rigid regime that I understand. The regulated asset base is, I think, where we're going to go in the UK. The way that they've dealt with it on Thames Tideway as the first proper way of doing this for big projects is very promising. And there's a lot of work going on now to look at if we can adapt that to use on big nuclear projects, but also more widely on big infrastructure projects. And by getting rid of that cost of capital, the unnecessary element of the cost of capital, and bringing it down to a sensible level, that makes a huge change. At that point, the financing markets can provide the money but it's got to be within the context of the security of a regulated system, not on big project risk, because frankly, there are limits to markets. That's why there's an L in PLC, which people keep forgetting. And more than about four or five billion, it's, it's just too much. So RAB should be a very neat way of solving that for the UK. So obviously there's an economy of scale. How many reactors do you need in a fleet to realize those economies of scale? And what savings do you find? Right, so what you're really looking at is that you go from the first of a kind in a country down to the nth. The curve flattens off, there's an asymptote. Uh, my personal belief is that that asymptote in the UK is probably pretty flat from about unit six or seven onwards. But if you look back to the scale of what we need, there's at least one model that suggests that we need somewhere of the order of 60 to 70 gigawatts of nuclear. You're way, way down any asymptote for that provided you build a relatively small number of designs. And that, again, goes back to the 2008 white paper, where we're looking at a small number of designs just built over and over and over again. The need for the UK is such that you quickly get to the asymptote, and then it's really about how fast you can then speed up the inter-unit delivery. There's an issue of confidence and trust in nuclear. How are you countering that in the UK market? Right, you just use the two words that are so important. Trust and confidence is right at the heart of every big infrastructure project, whether it's nuclear or anything else. And there's two aspects to it. One is trust and confidence in government policy and the stability of that and the recognition that once you've figured out the right way to get to 2050, to quote, I can't remember who the guy was, but somebody said, if it's not necessary to change, it is necessary not to change. So we have to have a a political system that recognises that. That's the first bit. But the second bit then is, OK, if I have a context where I know that the policy is you're just going to keep building these things, the second bit then is how do I know that the revenue that they generate and the returns that go back to the financing system are reliable and as low risk as possible in terms of regulatory risk? So the next bit then is about how do you have a sensible, rational regulator who is thinking about those long-term consequences? So economic regulators in the UK work on five-year control periods. Well, that's a joke. For a nuclear system, once you've built the thing, nothing much changes for 20 years. So you need a much longer wave regulatory system. And you need a regulator who is thinking about those really long-term consequences, not this short-term control period. So regulators are no longer thinking, should not be thinking just about the cost of the consumer right now but the cost of the national economy over the time scale of the decisions that are taken to build these things. That applies really to any rational regulatory system where you're looking at a massive pace and scale of change. So we need confidence from the politicians and confidence in the regulatory system. What is the critical path for restarting nuclear in the UK? The critical path for restarting nuclear in the UK is really about momentum. 
It's not about events. There are, there are a few events on the way past. So, for example, going from Hinkley Point C to Sizewell, you've got to do it in sequence. There's got to be, um, Sizewell has to be ready to start at the point when the people are ready to move from Hinkley. Because what makes that economy of scale, the whole fleet effect work, is the same people doing the same thing over and over and over again. You know, it's the old thing, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. The same thing for nukes. You just move the people across. So the mechanism that allows Size World C to be financed has got to be there in time so that we can move the people and the businesses from Size World, from Hinkley Point C to Size World, and so they, they can actually do exactly what we want them to do, which is the same thing over again, which is why you've heard Stuart earlier on today talking about having the site at, at Sizewell looking like Hinkley, so that when the guys appear on site, it's, oh, I recognise where I am, I'm doing the same thing again. Just repeat it, just don't change, don't even change the colour of the paint, just do it the same. A fascinating time then. Oh, it's an astonishing time. Um, I spent quite a lot of my career as a banker, and one of the things you learn as a banker is that you don't make money in very stable, dull, boring times. The more the volatility, the more people make, and so with this pace and scale of change, a lot of companies are going to do very well out of it. I think you also see that the, many of the nuclear projects are exactly what a pension fund is looking for in terms of the right sort of asset characteristics, in terms of uh, duration of return, the quality of the return. It's a, it's a cracker for that. So from all sorts of perspectives, from long-term jobs, the minute you start building nuclear power stations, there are jobs, lots of jobs there, really high quality for 60, 80, 100 years. You know, that's a, an opportunity to build a family on, and a family set of careers, so there's that. Um, there's the, um, the, the consequences for all the businesses, the investment opportunities, the, frankly, rejuvenating the UK economy. We've, we've kind of faded a bit as a manufacturing economy. We've faded a bit into, it's a bit too servicey, and the balance has shifted a bit too much. Uh, I grew up in South Yorkshire uh, where it was all steel and coal. In fact, most of my forebears went up there for steel and coal. There's been nothing put up there for years. So there's lots of opportunity for the former manufacturing areas and the, the relatively economically deprived areas to grow again. We've got the, the um, Nuclear Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre on the site of the pit where my grandfather used to work and around which I was pushed in a pram as a kid. And it's great to see those things coming back, but there's much more we can do. Lots of opportunity, simply coming from the necessary pace and scale of change. It's a very positive message. It is. I mean, the, 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 the fundamental issue here is that we have to do things. And with that change comes the opportunity to, A, make a difference to people's lives, but at the same time for many people in the community to benefit. The, pe the communities where the facilities are going to be built and operated, the supply chain communities across the country, there's a lot to be done. And the jobs that go with nuclear, which is why the unions are so supportive, last for generations and they're high quality jobs. They're not just making tea and sandwiches and digging holes. They're really good high quality jobs. And it was interesting uh, when we were doing the siting assessment last time around, any community that had an existing nuclear station, when we went there to talk to them about, you know, was this a suitable site for another new nuclear station, there was never a question. It was how fast can we do it, please? So the communities who've seen the benefits of nuclear to their community over the last few decades have seen it beautifully and we need them to tell the story. Not someone like me, but somebody whose family has grown up and benefited from that, that fantastic opportunity and the quality jobs in a really safe environment. We need those words out for everybody else to see because frankly to get to the sort of scale of nuclear that we need, that they need to be all over the country, not just a few of the existing sites, but many, many sites that are so far not yet nuclear. But what an opportunity for those, those communities who will take those um, opportunities in due course. Indeed. Well, Tim, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for, for asking me to, uh, to do the interview. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks a lot.